Hi everybody, I'm Antoinette, this is Board Game Inquisition and welcome to May's Monthly Roundup, the video where I talk about the changes to my board game collection. Hi everybody and welcome to, well, June. Um, May has come and gone and I hope you've been playing all sorts of exciting games at home that you're gonna to wanna to share with me when I tell you well, all about the stuff I've been up to. If you're new here, welcome. Um, it's lovely to have you. And what I do in this video is I talk about the new board games I added to my collection, the ones that have left, if any, kind of trades, stuff I've been playing and sometimes a bit of a wish list, but that's been really scant as of late, so I wouldn't expect much of that. And of course, I would love for you to play along at home. That's what the comments section is for. I love hearing what other people have been playing. It always gives me new games to look for. Um, so yeah, please do that if you are so inclined. Um, but yeah, overall, this is a casual video. Um, and I suppose, have I got more games played this month than last month? I would like to think I have. Um, I've been working on a number of review copies, so I'll share some of my thoughts with you on those, but I don't have the full thing formed yet. There'll, there'll be videos um, related to them. Um, but yeah, overall, it's been a better month for games than the previous month. Um, and with hopefully the advent of summer, um, there's going to be more games coming out soon as well. So we're gonna jump right into the list. Um, and I've only bought one board game this month. Mm, I know, I know. Um, but I don't know about you guys, but I just don't feel like there's anything I particularly want at the minute. And any of the games I have wanted, you kind of had to back on Kickstarter. It's been a bit of a crazy month for Kickstarter too. I don't know how anyone else is holding out, but um, I have a tendency to be very careful about what I would buy. Um, it seems to be lots of expansions and things like that all came up together. So I was really interested in the Root expansions and I was very interested in the new version of It's a Wonderful World, which is It's a Wonderful Kingdom. Um, and I, I'd love to hear what you've been backing because a whole bunch of things came out like yesterday. So the Witcher game, which seems I uh, questionable um uh, along with the new isle of cats expansion um dice of dragons which actually arrived to me during the month i'll talk to you about in a minute so there's a couple of things like that that are floating around but it means buying games is definitely smaller than normal but i'm really chuffed with this one because um i've been waiting for ages for it to come back into stock and this is calico um so yes 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 um calico is well it's got an adorable cat on the front so i guess it's got to be great um it only landed yesterday Today, but I've already fit a game in just because I was so eager to tell you about it all. And Calico is a game about making a quilt. A quilt comfy enough and well patterned and coloured enough that a cat is going to come and sleep on it. That's how I've understood the game at least. It's got serious um, Azul style vibes, if you like that. It's an abstract strategy game. Um, and I really, really liked it. It's super chill. It's got very nice components because you have your own player board and you're placing these little hexes of fabric out to try and connect them by color or by pattern. Um, and the way they click into the board is just really, really lovely. Um, so much so that when you fill your board, and that's a part of the game which I liked a lot as well, the game doesn't when someone you know finishes it and you get to complete your entire quilt um but the pieces wouldn't come out when i tried to tip it upside down afterwards they were so tightly wedged um which i liked a lot um the art is adorable this comes from beth sobel who you probably know from other amazing things like wingspan and 50 million other beautiful games i can't think of off the top of my head but it's just a really nice package it's small it's quick to play it's very cute and it's very fun um i think yeah it's definitely in that kind of azul setup um but i really liked it um i can definitely see me playing it again so it was definitely worth the wait um because there was quite a wait because it sold out so quickly after it came off of kickstarter but it's nice to see it finally here and of course, I assume no one would ever buy a game based on what adorable animal was on the cover. Definitely not. Um, okay, so that's the only game I actually purchased this month, but I did have another of a number of review copies come in that I would really like to tell you about. Um, so we're going to start with Dice of Dragons because it's currently funded on Kickstarter. Woo woo! Um, and I did make a video about this um, during the month. Um, this comes from Thing 12 Games and they have made a series of um, tiny dice rolling games that come in a tin. Um, what's special about Dice of Dragons is that it's cooperative. There you go. Yeah, that's kind of unusual. And it 
it feels cooperative to play as well, in which you and a group of your friends are trying to steal coins from a dragon. Um, and a lot of this is a push your luck mechanism about, you know, how you're going to dodge the dragon's attacks, how you're going to attack the dragon to get a lot of gold, and you do it all as a team. Um, so they're making a number of adjustments to the rules at the minute. So if you've seen my review, in which I say, I think the game is very challenging, um, and it was when I played it, they're adjusting some of that right now. So that's always nice. Um, but I just thought it was such a well put together game. It was super clever. So if you like games that are in a tin, but you want a kind of a bigger experience and you want to play it with your friends, then I definitely recommend checking out my review for that. Um, of course, the other thing on Kickstarter, and I always have to give them a mention out, is Pilfering Pandas. Um, this is from Ren Games, and as some of you may know, um, I'm the social media manager for Ren Games. So I didn't get to review the title. Um, instead, I made some playthrough videos, which you may have seen go up um, over the past month. I'm not sure how successful playthrough videos really are. Um, I'm not sure myself and my husband are particularly entertaining on camera, but I hope it at least gave you an idea for how this game plays. It's a game about set collection, um, hand management, and you are adorable pandas trying to escape the zoo. It feels very much like a traditional card game. So if you're into those, this is definitely probably most definitely up your street. Um, and it's just kind of, it's kind of cute and whimsical and it's doing rather well on Kickstarter. So yay, I'm so happy about that. Um, <laughs> hence the pandas but um yeah i think it's worth having a look at if that's your kind of jam i don't think it'll be for everyone's tastes um but i think it's, it's a fun game um so see all the, the kickstarter bits coming in here together um another game that i have who did you write me which one i'll do first okay is a game called turing and this comes from man o kent games um, see, I don't know if they're all separate words or not. It's all together. Man, oh, Kent Games. We'll go with that. Um, and the first question, of course, is do any of you know what the Turing test is? Um, so the Turing test is a means in which you're trying to determine if something is AI or human. So like if a computer could pass for being human based on how it responds to you. Um, I thought this was a really fascinating concept for a board game. Um, and so I have a kind of a prototype of that. It'll be coming to Kickstarter, I think in another month or so. Um, but from what I've learned from it so far, um, do you like Mysterium? Do you like Digset? It feels a little bit like that where there is a, a person who is a kind of in charge of deciding the answers. Um, and there's some beautiful artwork. I'll bring up the picture of this. So there's basically some beautiful art and you have to decide whether the computer has chosen the answer or whether the human has chosen the answer. And you have to guess, you know, basically, you know, try and figure out the connections that the person giving the, the pieces might have made or if it was just like a randomly generated computer answer. Um, I think it's fairly cute and fun and it's light. I think it would be much better with more than just two of us. I think I have the issue where my husband and I know each other really, really well or know how our brains connect. So like he had a picture of a portal and then there was a couple of more ones and I saw there was one that looked like a Stargate and I'm like, that's that's yours. There's no way a computer chose a Stargate um, and so on. But um, I think the art is really nice. I think it'll make for a really interesting and fun party game and I really like the idea of it. So there'll be a full review of that coming soon I literally just have a couple of kind of games under my belt while I was trying to trying to see what it was all about but um, I quite like that um, all right so next on the list I think I have one more yes and this showed up yesterday at random this is where it's uh, as my husband said I'm making it into the big time this is the first time a game has ever shown up for me that I, I didn't know was coming and this is Imperium Classics from Osprey Games and I was like What's this game doing here? Um, and what this seems to be, because um, it literally just arrived, um, is a game, it's a deck building game um, where civilizations are versus civilizations. And there seems to be a number of them to choose from in the box. Um, there were Vikings, I think, and like Anglo-Saxons and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they seem to be dueling against each other in terms of decks, you know, via cards. Um, the art looks really nice on the box. Um, people online who already have it have seemed to be um, a little bit worried about the rules, but I've been through some tough rule teachers lately, so I think I can handle most things by now. Um, but yeah, so I'm looking forward to trying that out. Have you heard anything about it? I, I didn't know it existed. I do now, um, and I'm probably going to put together an unboxing for it soon because I think it's worthwhile doing for new games when people don't know what's in them, but unboxings for games that are primarily made of cards, it's always a bit problematic, but we'll see how that rolls. Um, so yeah, so that was that. 
Um, did I have anything else to tell you about? Oh, that's it. That's it. So yeah, the inbox is not necessarily small. It's not non-existent, but I'm buying less games. Um, like there's only two or so games on my wish list, and neither of them are in stock in stores right now, so we're waiting. I'm looking at you, Praga. Yeah, I'd like to get a copy of that to try, and you know, whatever else I can find. Beyond the Sun, isn't it? Is that the name of it? The one with the cool tech tree? Yeah, I know, I know. Um, so maybe in a couple of months time, you'll hear me talk about those, but um, that's the new games for this month. Um, so yeah, what kind of stuff have you been picking up or looking at? Has Kickstarter become like your new shopping ground? Starting to feel a little like that to me. I'm a little disappointed that now everything seems to be on Kickstarter. It's hard to just decide, you know, this is coming out in the store, I'll pre-order a copy. Mm, yeah, but I'd love to know what you've been looking at, what you've been picking up, what you've been lusting after, um, and tell me all about it. Um, so I'll very quickly do the trade section because it doesn't exist. Thank you, Brexit. Um, and whatever else other madness is going on at the minute. So yeah, no trades, unfortunately. Maybe we'll see what we can do in the future. Um, and then I'm going to pop right into games I've been playing. And this should be an exciting one because I had so few games played last month. Well, I got them played for this month instead. Okay, let's start with the big guns then, um, because I had a number of games last month that I didn't talk about, so here we are. Um, and I'll start out with Oath. Um, so Oath is the newest offering from later games. You may have seen it floating around. Um, and it is a game really about trying to kind of claim the throne, or at least, you know, be in charge of it in some way. Um, there are three kind of roles you, you play as your characters. So you can be the Chancellor, which is the person who's kind of in charge of the whole land, and how they win the game is slightly different than how either the Citizen or the Exile would win the game. And, and these roles can change as you play as well. But mostly what Oath seems to be about is, yeah, working towards your goal of trying to win the game. But you do this by gaining favour with a variety of factions um, and you'll play cards that work with them and you'll activate cards for their abilities. Like, it's not, I want to say it's worker placement, but... It is, isn't it? I suppose it is, I guess it is. Um, where you send your, you know, your pawn out onto the board to activate the different cards and things that have been revealed. Um, there's a number of actions you can do to try and win the game um, and it depends what you want to do. Oftentimes it involves taking something from somebody else and each time you play, how like the board wins is slightly different. Um, now how this works is that the winner of the previous game kind of sets up the board for the next game. So this is kind of this weird legacy aspect it has going on. Um, it is subtle but important. So for example, if I won um, a game of Oath, all of the zones on the board that I owned will become like the capital in the, the next version of the game. Um, and any of the cards I had will kind of stay around. Um, and depending also on what factions um, were popular in the previous game, that changes the type of cards that will be available in the next. So it's got a lot of really interesting mechanics going on. Um, my big problem with it is, well, the rule book, actually I have two big problems. Okay, the rule book is one. Um, I always seem to have a problem with the rule books from later games. And in most situations, I can kind of understand it, right? So I've reviewed Vast the Mysterious Manor, um, and it is very similar to Root where everybody is playing kind of a different game. So the rule book was hard to get through because how you teach someone else how to play is very different from how you play and you may not know how to play those characters. And it basically implies that everyone should be reading their own section of the rule book, which seems kind of doesn't make the most sense on game night. You know, hi, sit down, read this entire section if you want to know how to play the game. Um, so Root um, carries that through a bit as well because all the characters are different and how you play them is different. Um, and they're, they all have their own kind of section in the rule book as well. Um, so, you know, this seems to be a trend, but when you get to Oath, I thought this was going to be a little easier because people aren't necessarily playing their own game. As in, we all, you can see what everyone is doing to win. It's much more obvious than the other games. They're not entirely personal goals. You and I could be going for the same thing. And I thought that would mean it was a bit easier to teach, but um, that's not the case. There's just so many bits and bobs and rules and things to get under and, and concepts to follow through that it was really, really tough. Our first game, um, 
<laughs> I want to say it took us like more than five or six hours just to try and nail down all the concepts. I've played five games now and I still feel like I'm only unraveling some of the connections that are made there. Um, I suppose my issue with Oath is that parts of it are really, really brilliant. I really love the interaction between the cards and the different factions that give you favours. I think how that works is really cool. I like how you use cards to, for abilities and things like that. Um, I like how you are able to activate things. You have a set number of supplies that you can spend um, out, you know, to help you perform actions. And I really, I really like all of that bit, but every so often it just gets caught up in its own unnecessarily weighting this because I don't feel like the game is that complicated but to be exactly sure how everything works is a task in itself um so I don't I don't know where I stand on Oath yet because there's part of me that thinks it is it, it's, it's there's something definitely there and I wonder do I just need to keep playing it to get there um and that's a lot of a commitment for a game right you know like the plus side of course is that is it a beautiful game? Of course, it's gorgeous. It's got a neoprene mat. It's got some lovely meeples that I wish were screen printed on both sides. You have some nice player boards or some extra tokens, some game trays. You know, it's really got it all. Oh yeah, and a beautiful like little kind of leather looking bound journal to it. Um, the major drawback for me is that this game says it's for two players and it's not. <laughs> um, if you want to play this game at two players, you either have to play two characters each or you play with the automated player, um, the Clockwork Prince. And we don't like the Clockwork Prince. Um, he's got kind of a flow chart that you follow um, to decide what they're going to do, which isn't particularly clear. Um, and having another player which one of us has to manipulate the whole time is such a letdown. Um, I know with Root, for example, you are expected, if you want to play a two-player, that you should only play certain factions with each other, um, that they'll only work well with each other. And that is limiting in its own way, but we kind of always ignored that and got away with it. But I don't think you could play this game with just two. It's designed to be interactive. It's designed to have people um, kind of engaging and getting in each other's way. Um, and I just, I'm just disappointed um, that, that we can't just play it ourselves, that we have to have this extra thing that we don't enjoy doing to make the game work. So yeah, so it's not sounding overly positive about Oath, although I do enjoy my experiences with it. I, like I said, I wonder, so I just need to keep playing it more. There are some games that just need more time than others to unfold. I think we're all aware of that. Like I said, I think I have five games into it now and I still feel like I'm kind of getting to grips with everything. And I don't know if that's a point where I should stop and say, okay, I'm going to review it now because this is this seems like a fair distance to have gone. Um, but I also don't feel like I've gotten all the way there yet. Um, like my rule has always been to play a game until I feel like I fully understood it and could explain it to somebody else that I had my head fully wrapped around it. Sometimes that's three plays, sometimes that's eight plays, sometimes it's whatever. Um, but I go until I'm comfortable and I'm, I wonder will I ever get comfortable with those? I've no idea. Um, has anybody else been playing it? Um, I want to know what you guys thought because actually you know what I'm just annoyed because it could be so great I just I hate I just hate this kind of I don't want to say complexity for complexity's sake but I don't because I don't necessarily know if that's true here but it just feels a little bit like it whether it is or not um because I like I don't feel like the game itself is overly complicated but getting getting into it is so yeah so there you go that's my um, stream of consciousness on oath um tell me about it if you have tried it or if you'd like to try it have you any questions okay so we started with that um now the next set of games that came um last month were those two adorable japanese games now i've not gotten to both of them because as it turned out reach the space game is a dexterity game and i was like i'm just gonna put that to one side for a little bit and we focused on the other one whose name i'm not going to try and pronounce i think it's okazi yeah i'll put it up on the screen because that's safer and this is a game about sequencing dna so i did get to give this a try now it kind of comes in its own little packet and it's got the rules written on the back of it and there's a link to some further rules and you definitely need the further rules um and it took a lot of i know the rules weren't great it took a lot of effort to figure out exactly how this game works i think we hope we're right it, it you know i hate that uncertainty um but here we go here's what i think is happening so 
you, there are 18 cards in this, so it feels very much like a wallet game. And each one has like half a strand of DNA on it and some letters. Um, so it's like F, A, C, T, I think are the letters. I assume this is all to do with the theme of, you know, um, DNA and stuff, but it's been a long time since I studied biology, so I can only remember so much. But you have a hand anyway of six cards and there will, your opponent has a hand of six cards. It's a two player game only. Then I'm starting to wonder if it is six cards, if there's one in the middle. Either way, you have a handful of cards, so does your opponent. And there is a series of cards down in the middle. Now each card works in multiple ways, okay? So this is where it gets fun. So you can look at the card straight up and read it. You can turn it upside down and read it. And they also go back to front and upside down. So the cards work in all dimensions. And what you need to do is there's a series of cards face down in the middle row, and you have to get your cards into play in the exact same orientation as the ones that are already there. Um, yes, it's okay, that sounds easy enough. But how this works is, um, at the start of the turn, there'll be like one genome or one DNA card, and they have two pieces on either side that you can connect with. And you place one and your opponent places one. And if it matches the strand, you'll get to put the card down into play, into in front of these, you know, ones you're trying to match. Um, and, <laughs> and it's difficult because you can put cards down there, but then you can flip them and things later. Um, there are abilities you get to do if you don't get to go first in the round, which allows you to flip cards. Um, but also if you match the color of the DNA strands when you place one down, there are special abilities you get to use as well, which involve you like reordering your cards that you have in play. Um, so it really is kind of like a battle of wits game. I, th I think the theme is interesting. Um, it might be more interesting if you fully, un you know, if you're into science and you might fully understand this more than I did. But for me, this was a game about not quite ordering the line, but like hand management and arranging things in the right order before your opponent could. Um, there's some really interesting moments where um, you're trying to decide, you know, who who gets to put down their card first can be very important um, because that will determine colors for flipping and things. And you can do a lot of setting up plays from turns ahead. Um, so yeah, it, like it, it almost, not quite like chess, but almost like Onitama if you've played that, where you can kind of see, because you can see each other's hand because there's no back to the card. So you can have a guess what your opponent has or what they might want. And you can see what they want to put in play, but how you prevent them from doing it and how you do it yourself is really the puzzle here. Um, so yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think it's a, it's a game where it's really about the players. Um, but some of the, the mechanics here are super smart. Um, it wrecked my brain trying to figure out what way around my card was supposed to go or how I would need to turn it to get it where I wanted it to go. Um, but either way, yeah, a really cool little thing. I think if you like little cool player card games, this is good. Um, so yeah, review coming for that later. Um, so yeah, well, I have to tell you about it because it came last month, right? And what else do I want to tell you about? Because we're going to run out of space soon. Oh yes. So the other game that came last month that I hadn't played yet was Smartphone Inc. Um, and now I'm capable of telling you that Smartphone Inc. is a game about, um, well, owning smartphone companies or a company that manufactures smartphones. Surprise, surprise. Um, and in this case, kind of how Smartphone Inc. works is that you want to sell phones and there are certain markets for them. So you have to decide how many phones you're going to make, how much people are willing to pay for them. Um, and you know, big economy questions. <laughs> um, yeah, it's very much like a game of math where you can work things out. So much so that your player aid comes with a multiplication table. Yeah, now, okay, math be as math may. The theme here is nice. Um, it, it makes logical sense to, for, it doesn't feel like it is mathy. I don't think it feels very mathy because you're going, well, these guys want this for this much money and these guys want this. So that means this and this. Now it has a couple of really interesting parts to it, um, which is when you're choosing what actions to do, you're basically doing a 3D spatial puzzle. You have these little boards with the icons on it and you cover up so many of the icons to make things happen and whatever ones are showing are the um, actions you get to perform. So in a little like, race for the galaxy or something like that there's a set series of actions that can happen but it's up to you to elect if you want to do something in those phases um and how and basically kind of the strength of the actions and things um you could do research um which i liked which would help you sell more phones you can branch into new markets and move along there um overall like this is a very clean and crisp 
game. Um, I, I quite liked it. I think the board is very lovely. Um, what I found odd was, so for, you can go and get upgrades or technology to enhance your, um, your phone network, of course, because people want 3G and wireless and God knows what else people want. Um, but that section of the board was set in stone from the first um, release of the game, meaning they didn't change, which I thought was a little wah-wah. But the expansion, which we somehow got with the box, because this was a trade, does seem to allow changes like that. And there is a specifically two-player board. So we played with the full size board at two players just because we're mad like that. Um, and I didn't mind it at all. We do play here like very distinctly, like we played our own games and sometimes we fought over places like China. But other than that, it, you know, we did our own thing. So I think if you want something a bit more interactive, um, that two player board version seems like it might be a good way to go about it. Yeah, but overall I quite liked it. I think it's gonna stay in the collection. We've only played it once, but there's something so, um, sharp about it and I also feel like it's a game that we don't have already that um, it does something different than everything else we've got going on um, which is a nice thought in this day and age right <laughs> absolutely um, right now have I anything else to tell you about <laughs> I laugh about it just because I'll throw it in here but I'm not sure if I mentioned it at all recently but you know every so often you just want to sit down and you just want to play something nice um, and we took down Azul for the first time in a good while, I think. Yeah, I think so. We were playing Azul. Um, and it's just, I, I'm having a serious sense of deja vu. Did I talk about Azul last month? I could just, you know, swap the word Azul for Saikatsu because I'm still playing a ton of that. Like, as much and all as I love the big heavy games, um, and trust me, I do. I love games of all shapes and sizes. Um, the, <laughs> you just don't always feel like you can sit down and manage one of those. So I've had a number of small games traipsing their way through my life um, on rotation, which is Saikatsu, the wonderful bird game that I am yeah, still obsessed with. And we played some more Azul, which is funny because it turned out we'd been playing Azul wrong for a really long time. And I only found out in an embarrassing way when I was playing with somebody else online. I was like, oh God, that makes the game so much easier. And finally, um, we've been playing quite a lot of It's a Wonderful World um, because I, that just never seems to get old. Every time I look at the box, I go, yeah, I'll play that. So, um, yeah, so that's what I've been playing um, amidst um, other things. But those are the main ones. Um, I want to know what's been hitting your table or, or, or if you are preparing to meet up with people for realsies, um, what are you going to play with them? What's the first game you want to show to people? Because I got a pile. I got a pile. If anybody gets to my house, I'm like, finally, um, come hang out with me. We will play games. I have so many. You must see. Um, so yeah, I want to know what games have been getting you excited. Okay, so the next section is the one where I'm going to talk about some of the personal stuff to do with the channel. So you can switch off if you don't feel like that stuff. Or you can listen in if you do. All right, next bit. So first thing I have to say is, did anybody watch the Eurovision? It was amazing. I kind of, oh, I love Eurovision. Um, I think it's just one of those kind of Irish traditions. Because there was a time when Ireland was very good at Eurovision. We were good at singing things and winning Eurovisions back to back for some reason. Um, we haven't done well in recent years, but I think it really set up a love for Eurovision in Ireland as a whole. Um, so when it's Eurovision time of year, it's, it's almost like, not quite like Christmas, but it's kind of the day where oh, we're going to sit down, we're going to listen to some amazing pop songs or whatever. Um, see what Europe thinks is good music, judge them horrendously with points and then see who is the winner. Um, yeah, and I have to say it was super fun this year. There was lots of really, really great acts. I had a lot of fun staying up watching them all and joking about their outfits, cheering on Iceland. Um, and then of course all the votes and stuff at the end. Um, so I stayed up way past my bedtime, um, hoping and praying to see who would win. But um, congratulations to Italy. You get a wonderful song um, and I've been listening to it on repeat since Saturday. So that's like five days ago, I think now I've been listening to Eurovision on repeat um, because it was good times. But you know what? It's just nice to have something that makes you like feel a little bit gleeful, right? Like and super happy. There's just something nice about it. I, I went to bed on a high. I was like, woo, oh, Eurovision, wonderful stuff. Um, so yeah, if you haven't watched it before, it's it's well worth checking out. If you want just a bit of, of good nature, good, clean, fun with singing because you know that's what Eurovision really is um so yeah fantastic stuff there 
Um, okay, so other things. You may have noticed that I released a video that was not to do with board games. And I debated whether I would or not for some time. Um, but for those of you um, who don't follow me on Twitter, um, so I've been painting some miniatures in my spare time. Um, I do board game acquisition stuff in the morning. I'm painting miniatures in the afternoon for the most part in an effort to find something relaxing to do that has kind of a nice outcome because I've been playing war games. So it's been nice to see the things get painted, right? So I've been doing that. Um, and in that quest, I was looking for something to remove paint from a model because I'd made a bit of a mess. And I watched some YouTube videos and I ordered a product that, you know, YouTube said would, would do the job. And when it arrived, um, it was paint stripper and it had a stripper on the bottle. Allow me to show you. Yes, I know, a stripper on the bottle. And I was kind of appalled. I sent it out in a tweet. And then I found out that the company who made the stripper bottle was even worse than I had thought and had made a book about how to like make gas chambers and stuff. And I was like, how is this even real? It was kind of disgusting to be very fair. And I had a lot of men come at me because it was like, oh, it's just a dad joke and whatnot. And I don't particularly find sexism very funny because I find that certain parts of the hobby it's harder to be a woman than others it made me very much appreciate the board game community I'll tell you that um because I think that the war gamers are almost I don't want to say worse but they're definitely more something something words because um I don't want to generalize but that's just my own experience and I actually felt like it was a bit of a kick in the gut when I, I was like I'm going to do painting I'm going to work really hard at this and then you get something like that and you're like well clearly I'm not a part of this hobby at all this is a man thing um so yeah so what I did instead was I, I bought a different product that um a, a, that I, people suggested was worth trying and I used it and I made a video about it so I was like why not? I'm like, I'll put the female version of paint stripping out there of, of what I thought was good. Um, I don't know if it's any way good or useful, but I kind of felt like I wanted to bring some closure to the story. Um, but um, I was like, well, if more women do it, maybe more women will find it. I don't know. But it was fun anyway, because um, it magically turned out I had a lot of camera and lighting equipment that worked good for miniatures. Um, that was mostly accidental. So I'm hoping that I might do some more painting things in the future. Um, just small stuff. And if you're not into painting, that's cool. You don't have to watch it. There'll still be board game stuff. I'm not changing anything about that. Um, but it didn't make me realize I'm very much what I'm calling an omni gamer. I'm, I'll game at anything. I think I'll play most stuff. I'll try it. I'll get into it. Um, and I, I like that about myself. I like that I'm not just, oh, I'd only play board games, but never collectible card games. No, I would do all of that stuff. Um, and I suppose this like little side adventure into painting, has kind of shown that up for me a bit. So I'll just be putting it in its own little section of the of the YouTube, <laughs> so you can ignore it at will. Um, but I'm hoping I'll do just a couple of little videos about me painting up my miniatures. Like it's not gonna be good. It's mostly for me. I like the idea of having a record of what I did to the miniature and how it looked at the end and maybe I'll get better over time. Like something small and sweet like that. Um, but sure, you never know where these things might lead because I did start Board Game Inquisition because this is the thing I like to do and I, I like sharing games with people. And I don't understand why miniatures would be any less of a game than a board game. So yeah, so that, that's where my brain's going at the moment. I'm kind of, instead of narrowing my focus, I am broadening it ever so slightly. But yeah, I'm excited for this coming month. I have a, I have a bunch of games now I can't wait to get to. I think I finally like shaken off that whole, Ooh, board games thing. Um, I just have been busy because, you know, Kickstarters and stuff make people busy. And I'm just looking forward to getting back to my own bits and bobs. Um, you may have noticed I have a new chair. Ah, I'm so excited. Um, and that means I'm going to probably change a little bit of the, the backdrop here as well, because the chair is that much bigger and 100 times more comfortable than what I was using before. So um, finally, because lockdown had ended, I could go and look at a chair at a shop. Um, it took me ages. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I have a couple of like thoughts and things going on around here about, you know, this being fun, like it should be fun um, and I'm having fun and I want you to see I'm having fun as well and have fun too. Like it's a fairly simple concept now that I think about it. 
But yeah, so that, that's basically what I'm doing. And as of today, I'm going to get my second vaccination. So I should be fully vaccinated soon, which is also really exciting. Um, I assume everyone else is out getting jabbed left, right and centre as well. Um, so maybe, you know, we'll be able to have people over soon and, and play games for realsies, um, which would be great. And I've used realsies twice in the same video today. You can tell I had coffee for breakfast. <laughs> but yeah, so overall, things looking good. More games coming. Um, lots of work to get doing, but I have lots of ideas. So yeah, good spot. All right, so I will call it here. Um, if you have any comments or questions you want to make about anything that came up in this video or anything that didn't, feel free to ask away. I'm, I'm kind of an open book a bit, I'd like to think. And I'm looking forward to hearing about your games. Um, so yeah, so until next month, everybody, have a fabulous June. Oh, June, it sounds like summer. <gasps> summer, God, that'd be nice. All right, everybody, take care. Bye-bye.